Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for the first episode of uh, this new series that I'm starting called Hidden Gems, um, pieces that I uh, feel particularly connected to and admire that are lesser known for whatever reason. And we'll start today on relatively safer grounds with Fritz Kreisler uh, with a lesser known piece by him. It's the Romance, Opus 4. I fell in love with this piece actually as a uh, in its version for string quartet, which is a little different. It's the slow movement of Chrysler's string quartet, um, and I was so thrilled to know that he wrote this version for violin and piano. So we'll play it for you now, and afterwards we'll have the wonderful Eric Wen, who literally edited the music from which we're playing right now. Uh, join us and talk a little bit about Chrysler, this particular late romantic style uh, of composing for Chrysler, and his background as a um, composer in the first half of the 20th century. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
listening. Uh, there will be more music after my talk with Eric, the Versos Romantique, Opus 9, a slightly more well-known piece by Chrysler, although also not one of his uh, most popular ones, and it's very much in this style. So I hope you stay with us, and uh, here we go, Eric Wen. And hello to Eric Wen, who is joining us. Uh, thank you very much for... Well, thank you for asking. Yeah. It's nice to be with you. Oh, okay. I wish uh, we met each other in person. Yes, I know. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, but I thought it would be particularly appropriate for me to ask you some questions about Chrysler, since I'm literally playing the music from uh, <laughs> the score that you edited, uh, the complete I guess, Chrysler uh, collection. Um, and I wanted to sort of go through, first of all, just some general thoughts about Chrysler as a composer, and then specifically about the pieces that I'm doing today, which are more in late romantic style, and how much is it really typical of Chrysler. So maybe first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about Chrysler's sort of background, mostly as a composer, um, growing up in Vienna, and how did he develop? Well, basically, Chrysler, um, you know, his father actually comes from Poland and um, he was a doctor and they lived, um, moved to Vienna, as many aspiring um, people did, professional people. And Chrysler was part of this very middle class uh, intelligentsia kind of world in Vienna. Um, apparently, his father was friends with Sigmund Freud and Arthur Schnabel was sort of lived in the neighborhood. So he really grew up in a very distinguished musical cultural milieu. And he was, of course, a very gifted boy. Um, all these stories about him, you know, as a child. But in any case, he did enter the Vienna Conservatory when um, he was very young, when he was six years old. And um, he studied with Josef Helmsberger. Um, who was uh, actually knew Brahms and was one of the major violin figures in Vienna. But he also studied composition with Bruckner. Bruckner taught at the Vienna Conservatory. And, you know, uh, a lot of people say that Bruckner was a little bit gauche in manner, um, humble, but a little bit simple-minded in some ways, although he wrote such big, huge canvases of music. But it's interesting that Chrysler did study with Bruckner. Obviously, a lot of the chromaticism of Bruckner's writing must have, you know, he must have heard the music. Whether he got that from Bruckner himself, I don't know. I know Bruckner studied with Simon Zechter, who uh, Schubert wanted to study with. So he certainly comes from a great, um, you know, Germanic, Austro-Germanic tradition. Um, Chrysler's reminiscences, he sort of pokes fun at Bruckner quite a bit. Um, but um, anyway, so he had his training, formal training in composition in Bruckner's class for two years. Then he went on to the Paris Conservatory and uh, he was only eight years old. He got the, he sort of graduated. What, what they do in these European conservatories is they give prizes, meaning prizes to complete the course. And Chrysler, of course, received the first prize in violin. So he was um, admitted into the Paris Conservatoire, where he studied with Lambert Massar, who, studied, uh, who taught Vinyavsky <clears throat> in violin. And he also was in Leo Delib's class in Paris. And so he was there for two years. And Delib, of course, is famous for his ballet scores, Coppelia being the most famous. And of course, um, you know, Chrysler said that Delib's you know, was always um, interested in courting, you know, um, you know, seeking out female company and often would cancel his classes. So Chrysler would, would sometimes, you know, finish up little pieces that the Lieb started on the board. Of course, Chrysler was a great spinner of yarns and this may have been one of them. But formally speaking, he did study with two very, very mm -hmm. prominent composers, Bruckner and Delib. Yeah, and so it's, I think particularly interesting that he studied with Bruckner since really nearly everything that he wrote, Chrysler was short pieces and we associate Bruckner with these uh, gigantic structure. So did he, at least in his youth, write uh, 
longer works, sort of in that vein? Well, um, in his, you might say, uh, compositional oeuvre, his biggest piece, I mean, let's not count the operettas, of course, which is made up of little numbers, but um, uh, um, he did write a string quartet in 1919, and that was written in part because he was extremely famous as a performer, especially in the United States. And of course, during the First World War, there was this wave of anti-Germanic feeling because they were the enemy. And so Chrysler's concerts were boycotted. So he did spend time in New York, but he wrote a lot. And he wrote his string quartet, four movement, proper string quartet that the Kneisel Quartet premiered. Chrysler himself made a recording of the piece much later on. Um, but in any case, also in 1919, he wrote an operetta called Apple Blossoms. And he wrote it with a fairly prominent operetta composer named Victor Jacobi. And Jacobi wrote about eight numbers. Chrysler wrote, there were a total of 19 numbers. So Chrysler wrote the, the lion's share of uh, musical numbers. And the cast for this operetta included um, Fred and Adela Astaire, John Charles Thomas, the great baritone, sung the title role. And in the premiere, apparently the audience members, because Chrysler was so well known, included a very, very prominent people, including Rachmaninoff, Gabrilovich, John McCormick, and of course the violinists Isai, Elman, and Heifetz. So this was a real event, Fritz Chrysler writing a Broadway musical, if you like. Um, and he also wrote another operetta uh, much later in 1932, which is interesting. 1919 is when Apple Blossom was premiered right after the First World War. 1932, of course, is just before Hitler assumed power in Germany. So it was this interim period between the wars that these two works were kind of performed, kind of landmark years, if you like. Now, you asked about Chrysler's other compositions. Well, I know he wrote a number of songs, both in English and uh, German, and many of the songs with the English text, um, they, they, they have sort of cornball titles, like A Burst of Melody, or Follow Thy Star, or Learn How to Lose. These are <laughs> the titles I can, Love Comes and Goes. You know, so these are the kind of English um, language songs he wrote. He wrote an Irish song, for John, who of course is John McCormick, but he also wrote a number of German leader. Um, he wrote a set of three leader known as Nachgesänge, uh, and these were to the words by Josef von Eichendorf, mm -hmm. who Schumann um, wrote you know, songs to. Um, there's words by Gottfried Keller called Gazel. Um, what's known as the Cradle Song is actually Caprice Viennois, and there's a song I think both you and I had sort of looked up in the Library of Congress, Opus 7, we don't know what it is. You know, <laughs> of course, that, that's another song um, that he wrote. So he was pretty prolific. You know, he's known for his short violent pieces and arrangements, but he wrote operettas and leader and of course the string quartet. Yeah, so I was wondering about the, the, the leader. Is that very much in this, because Chrysler was very, at least the writing for violin, is really multi-stylistic, if one could say. There are some neo-baroque pieces like Preludium and Allegro, and of course, yes. I guess the concerto in the style of Vivaldi. There are those late romantic pieces that I'm playing today, a little, sound a, bit, a little bit like corn gold. Um, and there are also the lighter ones, like the slide, sort of a little lighter style. So I was wondering, those songs, does he follow really the Germanic tradition of songwriting, so would it sound like Strauss? Well, or... I looked at the music, and from what I could, I never heard them perform, but looking at the music and sort of imagining, they are maybe not quite as chromatic. I mean, they, they're certainly in a chromatic vein. They're sort of like um, maybe early corn gold. Um, they are very much in that style. Actually, some performers actually recorded some of his songs, but they recorded the famous numbers. There's a, a record of Elizabeth Schumann, one of the great leader singers of her day, uh, singing the Cradle Song, which is Caprice Viennois. Uh, and even Caprice Viennois, I mean, if you listen to the harmonies, they're very, very rich. They're very 
um, corn goldish, if you like. Yes. So despite being a little violent piece, they're you know they're they're they're, they're quite wonderful. Or the slow section of the Tamun Chinois, you know, mm -hmm. again, very imaginative kind of language. That's right. And this is really what draw me to these pieces for today: the Romance Opus Four and the Brussels Romantique uh, Opus Nine. Um, is that yeah, the writing is definitely not simple for sure harmonically and also um it's interesting now that you um you talk about you know the operettas and all of that i find it in both of them there is an alteration between a sort of song like like a melodic section and a, a recitative like recitative sort of transitioning so maybe there is <laughs> yes i, something I think in that's that. true they, they sort of they diffuse you might say these pieces and certainly in the summer of the versus romantique I mean, some of those enharmonic modulations are really quite wonderful and quite imaginative, you know? So um, I think he was letting his hair down a little bit. <laughs> yes. And um, what did he, I mean, it, it, he famously wrote all these works that he attributed to uh, other composers. Um, <laughs> I don't, how much of a scandal was it when this was discovered? Oh my first God, of all? it was a huge scandal when it happened. Um, uh, I mean, what Itamar is, is referring to are all these pieces that were published as arrangements by Chrysler of pieces by Pugnani and Couperin, um, you know, pieces that he said he discovered in some monastery while he was touring France. But, you know, Chrysler loved to spin yarns. He could tell a tale. In fact, there's one story where he was talking to Misha Elman and they were talking, reminiscing about the great old violinists. And he was talking about Vinyavsky and how wonderful playing was. And, and they were both moved to tears. And then Misha Elman went back home and looked up you know, the lexicon and realized, no, they, they, they couldn't have listened to, heard Vinyavsky because he had died way before they had been born. But this was Chrysler. You know, he, 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 he loved to spin a yarn. But anyway, going back to the um, um, pieces that he so-called discovered, um, you know, he said he arranged them and he published them. And they were published by Schott under the title Classical Manuscripts, arranged by Fritz Chrysler. And they were published as such for over two decades. You know, there were pieces by Pugnani, Preludium and Allegro by Pugnani, arranged by Chrysler, etc. And what happened was in, I think, the 30s, he, um, I think it was, Yuri Menuhin was playing the Pugnani, Preludium and Allegro. And um, I think one of the major critics, maybe it was Olin Downs, I think, um, was trying to, it was sort of a lecture recital. And um, the critic was trying to find the original source and couldn't locate it, you know, couldn't find this, this original Pugnani piece. And he searched high and low, and then he communicated to Chrysler and said, well, where did you, you know, locate this manuscript in doing this talk? And Chrysler admitted, well, actually, the truth is, I composed them 20 years ago. And, of course, that scandal came out. Now, it was Chrysler's hoax, and, you know, a number of people took it, you know, good-naturedly and said, well, this is Fritz having a bit of fun. But Ernst Newman, who was the critic of the Sunday Times in England, took great outrage at, at this whole thing and wrote a long letter really, you know, criticizing Chrysler, denigrating him for, you know, doing such a thing and how terrible, you know, morally it was. And there was a series of letters that Chrysler and Newman had in the Sunday Times where Chrysler defended his position and Newman wrote back, you know, again, um, pointing this, 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 and this out. And in the end, I think Chrysler sort of won the day because, um, you know, Newman sort of belittled the pieces and Chrysler challenged him, okay, then you write a piece in the style of so-and-so and let me see if you can get that past the gatekeeper at the Royal Albert Hall which of course mm -hmm. Newman never did. So Chrysler really said, look, I did this because I wanted to have more pieces to play in my programs. I didn't want to have my name all over the place. So I used these pseudonyms, but, um, and then um, Newman belittled the pieces and at which point Chrysler was offended and said, then you compose a piece like this. Let me see how it sounds. And that was sort of the end of the argument, which shows Chrysler knew his compositional worth. 
you certainly did. Yeah, so, so that's interesting. First of all, there is, I guess, also um, kind of a more philosophical question about this. Uh, yeah. um, so do the, I guess the conclusion is that, that, that those pieces just an inherent musical value, basically just um, regardless of style or even attribution, kind of just transcends Absolutely. time and place. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're charming pieces. And I mean, obviously, if you heard the concerto by Vivaldi, I mean, it's amazing that Vivaldi wasn't so well known. But, you know, the truth is, in the early 20th century, Vivaldi, you know, Corelli, people like that weren't that well known. It was really the violinists of Chrysler's era in the 20s and 30s that revived the Italian Baroque. The first recording of the Four Seasons was not made until the very, I think it was 1945. That's the most ubiquitous piece mm -hmm. of the catalog. It, yeah. But there was no recording really until the 40s. Anything about the, specifically about the romance of before? I mean, you mentioned that uh, it was, um, uh, I guess, well, maybe you didn't mention that. It was uh, at least, as, um, it was a part of the uh, slow movement of the string quartet. That's how I yes. so-called so discovered it. I, I, I thought that the, that movement of the quartet was really beautiful and then I found out that there is this violin piano version of it, it I, which is rarely played. And I, I thought, okay. <laughs> well, I th I'm loving it that you're championing this piece. It's a great little piece. And I know you're playing the Viennese Rhapsodic Fantasietta. Is that correct? That's right. I'm playing. Well, I, I've been playing that a lot. Um, also, recently with an uh, arrangement for string orchestra. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. So I'm playing that a lot, and that's also very, very rich. <laughs> so oh, it's a wonderful piece. In fact, Chrysler had a real fondness for that piece, and he called it My Avowal for Vienna. You know, when he left Vienna, he never came back. He moved to the United States and never returned. But he always had a kind of association with Vienna. It was very deeply in his blood, if you like. And um, the Rhapsodic Fantietta was a piece that he really spent a lot of time working on. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, it sort of evolved initially as just a waltz. If you look at the Library of Congress, there's a thing called Vals, and that's the second part of the. Mm -hmm. And then he composed a sort of opening, you know, cadenza like um, improvisatory beginning. But I think it's a marvelous piece. It's Johann Strauss, you know, meets Richard Strauss. In <laughs> you know, it's a terrific piece and a lot of fun and, and substantial work. Yeah, that's right. His probably longest for violin and piano, right? I think so. Yes. Yeah, I think I think so. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm glad it's coming back. Yeah. Because it was a piece that was never played, but but and I look forward to hearing you perform oh. these these wonderful compositions. Okay. Thank you, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate you putting all of this in in context. It was really interesting to hear. Well, look, it's a pleasure. You know, I might want to add, by the way, that even the famous pieces, Liebes Freud, Liebes Leid, and Schoen Rosemarin, were originally published as old Austrian dances. <laughs> so even those pieces, Chrysler initially didn't own up to his writing of them. So, that's, really, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if it says something about him or just a practical... Uh, well, he decision. said it was a real practical, um, came from practical motivation that he didn't want his name to be appeared, appearing on the program. Violinist, mm -hmm. composer, you know, all that. So he thought it'd be better to, to keep a bit of anonymity. Um, you know, <laughs> he was, uh, yeah. despite his very open, kind of straightforward manner, I think he was a very complicated guy. <laughs> the, may, the way many, many of these Viennese, you know, musicians were, right? People from that era, very yeah. complicated people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, with that, I think, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure um, talking with you and seeing you even not in person. And That's right. uh, I hope you have a great summer. Oh, thank you. We're back um, with another wonderful piece by Chrysler, a little more well-known than the romance, but also not one of his 
uh, most popular ones. Uh, the Versus Romantique, Opus 9, um, a piece very much in this late romantic style that Eric was mentioning, uh, evocative harmonies, beautiful recitatives, and um, very, very surprising turns of phrase, let's put it that way. Uh, here it is, Versus Romantique. <laughs> Thank you too, Derek, and thank you.
you all for watching. See you next time.